continue in our season of Easter as we draw closer and closer to Pentecost, to that great feast that brings to a climax and culmination the, the season of Easter that kind of, if you look at it, began on Ash Wednesday, right, with its preparatory time of, of Lent. And uh, we went through Lent, we went through Holy Week, and so if you think about it, a major chunk of the year already, or certainly a significant period of time, has been given to this, this whole season and this time of reflecting on the Paschal Mystery, which is what our, our faith centers on. And so uh, such a powerful, a powerful moment uh, and something to think about and how our liturgy always, you know, informs our, our devotional life, the rest of our prayer life. Your prayer life should always come from Mass, from our liturgical expression of prayer, which is primary in the church. You know, we read, we're reading this uh, speech of St. Paul to the elders of Ephesus, and uh, it continues what he was saying yesterday that we heard. And one of the things that really comes across is, you know, Paul is an appointed leader. Uh, he has a, a, an encounter with Jesus, right, that knocks him off his feet, rather literally, or certainly knocks him from a horse or something, and he, he loses his sight, and um, he is restored. He becomes, he's, he's baptized, and he becomes an apostle. And, you know, Paul is not a missionary preacher with a special experience of Jesus. He is a commissioned leader of the Christian church. I've been kind of talking about that in these homilies that, uh, that you know, this is the church at work. And so when we, when we hear sacred scripture here, we're, we are hearing, um, you know, we're hearing about Catholic Christianity. We're not hearing about a Baptist faith. We're not hearing about a faith that isn't necessarily rooted in apostolic tradition. We're hearing about the Christian church that uh, where, the, where the leadership and where the, the way the church works, it's founded by Christ, continues to work through a visible authority, a visible teaching and governing authority. And so he, Paul says a lot of things here that are worthy of our, our attention. You know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a beautiful reading. Uh, he, you know, he really mentions, he mentions that, that he and his companions sought to give themselves completely to those whom they served. And because I don't have enough time to go into all of it, I will just say that, uh, that this is that evangelization of the peoples that is part of, of the new covenant in a very particular way. And we heard that in our responsorial psalm, right? Uh, that we read the responsorial psalm, uh, but we, the, the verse itself, okay, the, the psalm is 68, the verse itself uh, that the church gives us is sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. And so why sing to God? You know, well, sing to God nations. In other words, uh, that the, the evangelization is reaching you, that Christ's love is reaching you. Christ's love is reaching you. And these great, these, these great saints of our church would bring Christ to all parts of the world. Now, for the people of this time, right, the people that we're reading about in sacred scripture today, the world was the coast of Spain. The most they really knew about was, you know, Spain. They knew about certain parts of other parts of Europe, obviously um, some areas in Africa. But the, there was a huge part of the world that had not been uh, discovered by them. And so as we would continue, as history would roll on, they would go out and bring this gospel to, to every place. And so we're continuing, continuing with that, we read from our gospel taken from St. John. And I think it's important to remember that when we have our four Gospels, we are seeing four different views 
of the ministry of Jesus. The Joannine Jesus, right, Jesus in the gospel today, has a very poetic way of phrasing himself. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus is very blunt, very, very short and to the point, and very, very action-oriented. So in this gospel, John's portrait of Jesus has him kind of waxing eloquent, right, as he says his high priestly prayer. And there is a ton of repetition. And there is that particular style that we associate with St. John, right? You know, take them out of the world. They don't belong to the world, but we take them out of the world. They are being sent into the world, but they're being kept in the world. You know, and it's all this kind of, it's a kind of a, again, a sort of a poetry. And what Jesus is doing in this gospel, right, is he is praying for the apostles. He is praying for those that he would commission. And in fact, uh, there is similar language used by to Jesus in this prayer in the uh, consecration and ordination and exodus of the priest of Aaron. And so they are set apart from the community. And while cooperation in God's work is certainly incumbent upon all of the baptized, upon all of you, uh, the apostles are clearly being set forth or sent forth in a special way for preaching the word of God and sanctifying the world. And so the church says that the men that were ordained bishops that are successors to the apostles, right, that they are continuing the work of the apostles. And so I want to go back to that again, that it is not scriptural to read the Gospels, to read our Holy Bible, and to say there is no difference between any kind of way of life in the church, that there aren't priests or there aren't bishops or there aren't any of those things. The Old Testament had a priesthood. It had the Levites. It had a kind of a diaconate even. And Jesus Christ takes the template of how his father, how God is worshipped in the Old Testament, and then renews it and does, some, does it differently, but he does do it in a kind of a similar way in the, uh, in the New Covenant. And so, again, while all of us through our baptism are sent to our own particular communities, first and foremost your family, maybe those that you work with in your, your work environment, your, your grandkids, your communities, right? There is a group that is sent in a special way, and that is the apostles, and that is their successors, the bishops. And so just, just to kind of point that out. Now today I do want to mention something else, that uh, this is a day of prayer for the church in China, and it was proclaimed in Pope Benedict XVI's 2007 letter to Chinese Catholics. So this is a day where we, in a special way, as a universal church, pray for Chinese Catholics. Why would we do that? The Chinese government is officially atheist, and as you should be aware, are wary of what they consider threats to their security from, from religious groups. While Christianity is not illegal in China, ever since President um, Xi Jinping, I think, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, there has been more of a tightening of controls on religious freedom. Tens of millions of, of uh, people, of Chinese people, identify as Christian, uh, but there has been all kind of oppression of living out one's faith in China. Uh, there, the Chinese government created a state-controlled church called the Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association, CPCA. 
The Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association is not recognized by the Vatican and is not in communion with the Catholic Church. And the actual Catholic Church is an underground entity in China. And China is an enormous country with tremendous, tremendous, obviously, economic and social significance. And so today we're asked by our church to pray for them, for the, that they will have freedom of religion, right? Freedom to worship. We take that for granted, and that is not guaranteed. We have seen over and over how governments have perceived Christ as a threat to their domination of the people that live in their country. And so we pray for them and pray for this country as well, that we will continue to grow in freedom of religion and that Christ will defeat his enemies that, uh, that stand in the way of, of the exaltation of the church, the liberty of the church, that we will be able to live our faith out and witness to uh, the broader culture.